Hello dear viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're going to talk about the curse of solid bo rocket boosters. So let's dive right into it. Now what exactly are SRB? Well, they are ironically used by every single national space program. It does not matter whether it's from USA, India or European uh, agency. Almost everybody uses it, except uh, Russia. Russia does have some of them, but not too much of them. And uh, it's backbone of national defense because, well, you can't make a missile that runs on liquid system. Some ICBM does use a liquid system, but the majority of them are still solid. And especially ICBM interceptors, because they have to have ludicrously high G-force while they're accelerating, uh, they have to use solid. So you get that point. Like, Solid has a lot of use in weapon system, basically the primary uh, market of that and not to mention every country spends 10 times more on uh, weapon system than they spend on the space agency. So you get that point. Uh, it is very, uh, you know, important solid rocket booster systems. And it does have the advantage that if, even if you're not dealing with a complete solid system, for example, a space shuttle, you can plonk this puppy on and get more oomph out of it. So even if you have, let's say, a core that is not very powerful, like let's just say GSLV Mark IV or Ariane space rockets, you can be like, okay, let's gonna plonk left, plonk right and boom. So you can get more power out of it. And it is inherently far more simpler than a cryogenic rocket engine. A cryogenic rocket engine does have some parts that are ludicrously complex. For example, turbo pump. It's a whole different level of engineering. You are talking like turbo pumps that were on uh, basically used on space shuttle minions. They were like megawatt class power ratings, meaning they did not have like a horsepower. They were had to be measured in megawatt because it was like you know 10 megawatt or 20 megawatts, like ludicrously high amount of power that they had to utilize. And the injector plate, uh, that's another whole boom level technology. It's a very complex. So it is complex. It is far more complex to get a liquid engine working safely, reliably, and you know, not making sure it goes boom every time you want to start it. So that does add cost. Compared to a uh, solid rocket booster, it's far more simpler. And it does allow multi-configuration, which ISRO loves a lot. I'll talk more about it. Basically, multi-configuration simply means you have a central core and you can be like, okay, if the satellite is heavy, uh, add as many as you need. If satellite is not heavy, just don't have any. That's the multi-configuration. So even if you have one core system, you can add as much as you need or remove as much as you need. So that's the whole point of SRB. Now, why specifically I call it, uh, you know, a curse? Well, in reality, it sounds awesome on paper. Like, you know, oh, this is the same technology as used by military. It has this and that. It's like super simple. Uh, you know, it should be efficient. It should be cheap. Uh, reality is it sucks a lot in real life, meaning especially for space program. Be mindful. Right tool for the right job is a real, uh, you know, goal with everything. So it does work. And it is the, one of the only thing that can truly work for military systems. But for space program, it is a curse, basically. So it makes the core uh, structure very complex, meaning if you are talking about a liquid system or even a semi-liquid system basically if you have hybrid rocket or something like that you cannot be just like okay i'm just gonna plonk these two tall rock srbs you know what uh, i think the satellite needs something different so i'm gonna add six medium systems and two small ones or what about i add a four uh, mini mediums ones yeah that's the configuration of PSLV. i did specify isro loves a bit too much configurations where there is like i think 12 13 configurations possible on PSLV alone so you get that point like you in principle, it sounds, oh, we're just going to keep adding that. But reality, it just adds cost to your system. So the core, because you are talking about something that adds physical thrust to you, meaning it's pushing you, it has to be designed in such a way that it can handle the load. Especially if you have a sensitive core liquid into that, the casing will become far more complex. Even with solid booster, the casing has to hold on to, like, you know, all these puppies. And be mindful, when you are talking about, like, six or seven solid boosters, none of them will be uh, performing exactly the same. They will be in same enough range, but you still have to have enough stiffness that it can handle like okay a little bit of uptime because again they are solid boosters they are not throttleable so you can't be like hey i think you are producing more power calm down you can't do that it's like it's going it's going all in so generally they are very good and they are very close to close travel runs but still you have to design the core that it can handle that that adds ludicrously high cost to your core and it is very expensive now be mindful on paper it sounds super cheap it's just a powder inherently or a resin that you have to you know uh, set in a mold so it does not sound complex and compared to liquid uh, engine system it should be like you know free but reality is you are talking about boom powders now this boom powder potential it's very high boom capacity so consequence you need license and every company that can build this sort of propellant mix for you will have to pay a boatload of money to government to get that per uh, permit and licenses and everything and the safety meaning this sort of things plants where you can deal with this kind of boom system have to be you know in middle of nowhere how the heck you're gonna find a place middle of nowhere it's gonna cost a boatload of money so you get that point on principle it should be cheap but reality is ludicrously expensive just to get that propellant and it's a safety hazard because one once you built it, once you set the resin, once you uh, started to make that casing and all that jazz, it's on. Like liquid rocket, uh, you can take a, basically a liquid rocket engine, 
to your bed make love to it it's not going to do anything you take a basically solid rocket booster next to your bed rub it yeah static electricity is like allow me to show you boom so it is very hazardous meaning from factory to the, your rocket launch pad it's on it's armed it's active it's dangerous it has to be treated with serious respect and you know what that costs a lot of money meaning for example if you're talking about a normal uh, carrier you're gonna have a basic grounding system that you know takes your sort of static electricity that is like you know one or two grounding system more than good enough when you're talking about SRBs you will have upwards of eight or nine system where it's like no 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 we do not take risk with static we make sure you are absolutely strike every person who is like even allowed to look at these sort of things they will be like are you vetted to be here are you allowed to be here are you qualified to be here you get that point like all of those things awesome and that's why like uh, generally companies like ISRO and NASA and even ESA generally have a very good record with uh, SRBs but consequence cost goes up and this happened to Brazil when they were trying to deal with SRBs and again it's a very uh, you know bad tragedy now you may be like can't a normal rocket go boom yes and no a normal rocket has a stage where you turn it on basically where it goes from inert to active and you can do that when you have sorted everything out meaning that's why we have range safety meaning everybody is clear last person to live is like you know range safety officer is like looking around it's like is everybody removed like double check triple check and then you start to fuel the rocket at that point yes it is dangerous and yes principally it's even more boom potential compared to uh, any SRBs it is dangerous at that point in time but you know when you have made it dangerous it's not something it's like I'm carrying it to launch pad and achoo boom happens and not to mention it's dangerous even for the factory that happens so it's that's the aspect of it and inherently it does not scale on paper it sounds oh we're gonna add more we're gonna add some more and we're gonna add some more reality it would have been far more cheaper for you to just make bit bigger dull go home sweet dreams it's never scales well be it a space shuttle you in principle you should be able to like hey what if i add like you know one more uh, solid booster and carry much heavier payloads yeah in principle it can be done but because you have to redesign the whole core it's never done so consequence it's never uh you know scalable was like you know add as to you know as much power you need it never works out that way and it's non-mass producibles even though you may have a factory that is like you know quality assured and safe enough where it can mass produce like you know this puppy like a candies they will never do that simply because they have to store it and because it's an active arm system it's ludicrously complex to store like military have to spend serious money i mean like some serious money just to make sure the missile does not you know go boom in their like you know aircraft carriers and things of that nature like serious amount of money you have to spend to make sure those systems are safe and they are spread out enough that because again things happen bad things happen google cook off weapon cook off when like you know a fire from unrelated thing like heck you can have a normal engine fire but people are not ah, engine fire man let it burn out and again the chamber next to it was like you know boom potential yeah whole ship went boom so be mindful this is very serious stuff you have to treat it with respect it generally means a lot of money so what are the real consequences of the well i have already said that the boom is ready from manufacturing the moment you made it it's already boom potential and that whole pipeline should be safe that's the part that you have to understand how the heck uh, you know space uh, SpaceX can build this many Raptor engines. Again, none of them are very critical. I'm like, think of it as like the worst case scenario. Let's say a child runs around with a wrench and all that and it starts to banging on these things. Somebody catches it, removes it. Now, again, they forgot to properly inspect it. They put the engine on rocket. And what happens? Again, once they save it, basically range safety, then they turn it on, it goes boom. Okay, you lost a rocket, lo lost a launch pad, but no loss of life would have happened and none of your factory would be compromised. But imagine same scenario with SRBs. Yeah. And SRBs are ludicrously powerful. So that making that whole pipeline safe adds a lot of cost. And you cannot pivot this puppy up. You have to understand that ULA should be able to beat SpaceX in any matter, like especially in cost. It should not be possible for a, such a small company like SpaceX to even come close to ULA and it's like, sub bro. That should not be possible. But how the heck SpaceX did that? Is that pivot mechanism? Uh, like why the heck? Why the heck that pivot mechanism is so interesting? Well, think of it this way. Let's, space shuttle was built. You had these segments brought onto a place and then they jointed it okay now here's the it's fully loaded meaning it has all the propellant loaded into it again that's the whole point of solid booster meaning you cannot go like this same for gslv mark 3 it has solid boosters can you physically do that yes but good luck finding a crane system that is uh, you know capable enough of doing that now you're like how the spacex does that rocket is much lighter for its capacity meaning for something that can carry upwards of uh, 20 ton plus uh, to lower earth orbit it has more than enough lightweight capacity meaning that assembly that does like this it's not very expensive because the rocket is empty at this point in time and when you are talking about like space shuttle engines it's fully loaded and same goes with ula even though they are adding like tiny solid boosters it has to be done vertically and that adds exponentially higher cost 
So this system saves SpaceX a truckload of money. Now you may be like, hey, uh, SpaceX did uh, find themselves in a trouble because like, you know, uh, military wants their rocket to be vertically stacked, meaning the payload should always remain vertical. Military will give you in a vertical package, it must remain vertical. You should not send it to horizon. Here's the deal. SpaceX can still cheaply do that. All they have to do is build a secondary assembly next to the, they will still bring the rocket like this, stand it up and have a just a single grain that just plonks it on top. It will not be as expensive as for this SRB simply because again, they still did not have to worry about safing and the only one thing, the tonnage capacity and tonnage capacity would be fixed is like, hey, uh, what is the maximum tonnage capacity of this rocket? Let's say 60 tonne for Falcon Heavy. So they were like, okay, just find a uh, crane that can handle 70 tons. These SRBs, they are hundreds of tons. So you get that point. Like it's that alone saves boatload of money. Just the fact that they can go like this to like this. That pivoting. And quick turnaround. Again, you are seeing in real time, uh, SpaceX is pumping out these engines like they are going out of fashion. Can any other company do that with uh, SRBs? In principle, yes. Will they ever do that? Heck no. They're like, you, you told them, it's like, hey, can you, uh, you know, pre-order 10 pieces? They're like, shut up, take your money. I'm not one to talk to you ever again because it's a safety hazard. It's something they have to have giant bunkers for each single SRBs. It's ludicrously expensive and not to mention dangerous because e even if you have a bunkers for them, you will never assume that bunker can actually hold it. You'll always have worst case scenario. So in those sort of really, yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, mass produce. And that's why like, if, even when you were talking about something lightweight as firecrackers, they have like serious, do not mass produce, like do not ever reach 100 percent capacity meaning if your system can handle let's say 100 tons of fireworks do not actually push it to that limit always be you know safety margin so that's the whole point it cannot be quick turn out this rocket engine i can actually see them to reach a point where they are like you know oh we are producing you know every few hours it's like hey, okay who cares again once they fine tune it refine it and like you know let's say raptor 3 or raptor 4 they're like yeah who cares it's like just just must produce it so that's the whole thing. And you cannot gang them together. That's another aspect of it. In principle, so Solid Booster sounds like that. He's like, you, you have Solid Booster, you add as much as you want. Realistically, it never works out that way. However, it does work that same way for Liquid. Meaning, uh, SpaceX built Merlin engine. It worked Merlin 1 and uh, they had Falcon 1. Everything was nice. Then they thought, it's like, what if we make it bigger? And here's the, uh, if you go to any tank engineer, it's like, hey, can you make the tank bigger? Like, a ra let's say, radius goes from, let's say, 1 meter to 3 meters. They're like, okay. Not too difficult, again, it's just a tank. And not to mention, there's a things of physics, specifically with surface area to volume ratio, meaning the bigger your tanks get, the lighter it actually becomes per liter of propellant it's carrying. So you, it actually become much more efficient. So you, making it bigger is actually desirable. And you were like, okay, we're gonna go from one meter to three meter and be like, you know what? Let's plonk uh, five inches. So we'll call it Falcon 5. Then they're like, why stop there? Just go even bigger, 4.5 meter, and just put nine inches on that. That's what we call Falcon 9. So it's super easy to do that with liquid engine. Any startup company or any uh, space agency that's dealing with SRB, they are stuck with that. Basically, every time they have to like, okay, uh, upgrade the power, they have to redesign everything from scratch. So meaning the knowledge, the skill set does not carry over. Liquid, it carries over without any issue. That's the whole point. Super, super efficient in terms of company uh, R&D money. And Good luck finding a solid booster that restarts. None of them can. And uh, low to no throttle output. There are some system that does allow to, you know, throttle a bit here and there. And ICBMs do have advanced versions of that. Consequence, they will make your space program look cheap. Like there are ICBMs that can do those sort of amazing things. But yes, that's how expensive they are that they will make your space program look cheap. It's like, bro, we consume that much like, you know, for one rocket. It's like, bro. There's a whole different, like, you know, multiple zeros up and down between, like, you know, ICBM level technology and what technology you can do, you know, cost effectively. So that's the another aspect. Of it. That's why it never works out. SRB never worked out. Even the tiny SRBs cost you only so much that, like, you know, SpaceX is like, hey, how about I take your all your contracts? How about that? It can do that. So that's the why. Okay, now I'm talking about like this. There is a very good chance if I'm not crazy, if I'm not wrong, there may be more than enough engineers in these companies that are like, dude, we are doing something wrong. We have to improve. Well, the reality is they are, but there are some other forces at play that can, you know, kind of makes it very difficult. You have to understand one aspect of human mind, as in like this puppy, is that it ages. It's not same horsepower as like, you know, as you're in 20s, as, as in 30s and as in 50s. It's not the same horsepower. It changes. And as you become successful, specifically successful in your early 30s, you're going to hold on to that pattern. Whatever pattern that you made, your adaptability goes down. And again, it's a aspect of human neurology because of uh, it creates pathways. Those pathways not erased 
easily and again if you have been using the same neural pathway for let's say 10 years good luck trying to erase that it's, it's become a force of habit at that point in time so adaptability goes down now these sort of ideology of basically having a weak rocket and plonking as much uh, you know srb on top of it and then flying them it does work that's why isro does have uh, you know satellite launching capability that's why delta is a thing delta 2 delta 3 you get the point like these things did work that's why like we have icbm it does work but that's the problem it worked in 1970 because at that point in time liquid engines kind of stopped meaning their r d stopped and that was the biggest light bulb moment of elon musk so it's like he looked at it everything calmly is like let me look you know pull out a bit look at it and then he's like dude after the cold war ended uh soviet union ran out meaning the big money spender poof and uh you know america also was like dude we already succeeded so their money also went poof all of these puppy they basically turned to like hey can we refine our systems it's like you know just do it as cheaply as possible so nobody was like you know going back to the drawing board which we were doing a lot in the early days because again we did not knew but after 1970 everybody's like you know calm down everything calmed down again interest in space also went down so everybody calmed down about that now that was awesome for 1970 but that was the brilliant moment of Elon Musk where it's like dude how about a rocket that is built in 2000 that was like whoa that's why SpaceX alone can bitch slap every single else and many manufacturers basically the people who are manufacturing India's ICBM Agni series rockets uh, for DRDO can be the same people who are making SRBs for ISRO and same can go for uh, basically the people who are manufacturing solid boosters for uh, basically space shuttle could be the same making for ICBM also so there is a conflict of interest there basically it's like hey why do you want to redesign thing or like you know it would be cheaper like that cheaper aspect yeah it will be cheaper just to use us and anybody who has looked into SLS program is like it's never cheaper. It's never, ever, ever, ever cheaper. Always develop a new, better system. So that's another concept of that. Whereas like you know, a company might be like, dude, why do you want us to build a new liquid engine? Just just control C, control V, our like, you know, SRBs. So these two things are very significant thing. And another aspect is money. Now you're like, wait, wait a minute, isn't this expensive? Then why the heck money is playing the role here? Well, think of this way. They had to hire a people, boatload of people who are qualified enough to dealing with SRBs. That costs a boatload of money. They have to build a whole supply chain, meaning the train line they're going to use, the factories that they're going to use, the safety zone they have to establish. All that costed truckload of money, as in like truck full of money, that kind of money. And uh, once they have spent that, they have to pump out like at least, uh, you know, whatever their cost may be. It could be like, hey, we pump out uh, 1000 SRBs, then you will start to uh, you know go into profit zone it happens like sometimes capital cost could be ludicrously high so that case of you know chain feedback loop which we call sunken cost fallacy where it's like we have spent so much money to developing new casing style new this and that and you are just saying hey just throw all that away and like you know let's build a with lithium aluminum tanks and just go yolo on it you get that point like that uh, sunken cost fallacy also creates an issue and then final aspect is uh, philosophy at the end of the day, if you really want to see how far somebody can go, you have to study their philosophy. Now, everybody, uh, major corporations, they have philosophy of it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it does work. I mean, again, this is one of those things. It does work. That's why we have space program. But consequence is that uh, compared to SpaceX, SpaceX have a different philosophy. If you're not failing, you're not innovating, meaning they're going to try out 10,000 things. And the reality is other space companies will have a hard time achieving 100 rocket launches. SpaceX is on a different level. It's like we have done 100 rocket landings come to our level then we'll talk that's a whole different level that's like you know not not at the same level not at the same level so that's why people are stuck in this loop where the sunken cost fallacy the pipeline establishment uh, and the military all things and the fact that like you know old people is like you know it has worked for 40 years it's like that's the problem now update there's like no 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 it has worked for 40 years you're gonna go bankrupt it has worked for 40 years you're gonna destroy the whole goddamn dream of a country who cares it's like again this happens again it's not uh, looking down on people it's trying to understand them so what we can expect in the future well reality is all private company looked at it it's like once spacex opened the door as everybody was like huh i think we can do better so you have spacex the granddaddy again think of this way like they have already started to physically build the damn thing uh, like starship and it has not a single solid rocket system and i don't even think it's gonna have a you know emergency escape system so get that point like completely da shall say no to solid system and then you're talking about firefly they have already figured out launching this company is horrifyingly young and they're like ta-da we are launching a rocket now you were like hey, it did not reach it went boom yes deal 
but at least they have figured out how to do the supply chain. They have figured out how to carry a rocket from point A to point B, put a payload on that, put it on a launch tower, launch it. These things in a government agency will take years just to get through all that permit. And this company is like, we have an idea. Let's here's a rocket, here's launching the rocket. Now you're like, it went boom again. They will do it three or four times before they run out of money. So I do expect them to reach orbit at idiotically fast rate. They're like company registered this year, five years later, yeah, we are in orbit. Deal with this. Like, be mindful. Iostra also did that same thing. Like, very quickly. It's like five years. Like, very quickly from company being registered. Like, okay, this is our company. We're going to do this to here's a rocket that actually goes to orbit. It's horrifyingly fast. Same goes for, uh, you know, basically rocket labs. They went from like electron rocket to like refining electron rocket to actually becoming fast enough where their launch cadence is ludicrously good. And they're like, hey, you know what? We have enough spare money that we're going to figure out how to reuse this puppy and we're going to make a neutron rocket. And if neutron rocket works out, it will, uh, you know, uh, come close to Falcon 9. So every private company have learned this lesson. It's like, da shall not waste money on SRBs. But what about national agency? You can see this pattern changing. Meaning, even if you look at a uh, European agency's rocket system, you'll notice their solid boosters are now much smaller, and they have uh, two configuration, like two small ones or four small ones. They don't no longer have like you know giant ones and uh, you know multiple small ones. Like configuration count is going down, and numbers are also going down. But rather than like having 12, 13 configurations, uh, people are like you know what, just just two. Or maybe even so, even same goes for ULA also. Like their Vulcan rockets, they have much smaller SRBs. And again, there are some possibilities, which it should be if the rocket is as capable as they are expecting, they may never even need to use, uh, you know, SRBs because the diameter is big enough and it has enough liquid oomph to it that it can like, you know, I got this. So any company that does not go into it, be it national, be it uh, international or be it whatever have you, uh, they're going to have a system that is very slow to manufacture, very expensive and non-mass producible, meaning they're going to be bitch slapped by every single private space agency and they'll be like, like for example, my ISRO would be like, you know what, I will like, I will say this in 10 years, it's like, wouldn't it be nice like if ISRO, ISRO could do these all things simply because ISRO is just not letting SRBs die. And same goes for NASA, good luck with SLS launch. So this was my presentation on why SRBs are curse. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.